Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. We're doing a webinar today or a webinar, if you will, on efforts around the states to save the bees. Um, my name is Steve Blackledge. I'm the senior uh, senior director of Environment America's conservation campaigns. Environment America is a national group with a mission to transform the power uh, of our imaginations and our ideas into change that makes the world a greener, healthier place for all. Uh, we have 30 state affiliates around the country. Many of you, many of you know us through our state affiliates um, and where we work on state level and local policies. Um, we have this webinar today. We're happy to, we're so pleased to be here presenting it. Um, if people have questions, there is a question box down at the bottom. Is that, Ben, is that the Q&A box? Yeah, there will be a Q&A feature. So feel free to submit any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but then there'll also be a portion for Q&A at the end of the speaking portion. Uh, and that segment will, won't be recorded, so feel free to ask any questions you might have. Right, I should say that. We're recording this so we can put it up on YouTube, put it up on Twitter and social media, uh, but we will not be um, recording the Q&A, so you feel free to ask ask away. Um, you know, some of our environmental problems aren't as intractable as they sometimes seem. Uh, sometimes solutions are practically begging us to adopt them. I think that's true uh, to some extent, at least on saving the bees as well. Um, there are a number of policies that we can implement right now and a number that have already been implemented in the states. So on today's webinar, we're gonna focus on state level policies, what states have done to save the bees, what states are doing in states across the country. Um, primarily, we're gonna focus on efforts to restrict bee killing pesticides or neonics. Uh, as one of the leading causes of bee die-offs. And we're gonna speak some about habitat as well. Um, we're honored to have two guests uh, with us today. Um, we have uh, um, from California, where there is a very big effort to save the bees by restricting pesticides. We have Sarah Goodman, who is in the office of assembly member, Rebecca bauer Kayan. Uh, she's going to be speaking about efforts to save the bees. And from Texas, we have Senator Judith Zaffarini. Uh, the senator has a committee obligation right now, um, but she did prepare, and we're thankful for her to her, prepare a short video um, in which she talks about her work in Texas. So quick, a quick overview before we turn it over to Sarah. Um, bees are disappearing. There have been massive die-offs, and this is both of honeybees and of native bees around the country. Uh, bees are struggling. And there's currently one species of bumblebee that was placed on the endangered species list. There's another that is a prime candidate, sadly, to go on the list as well. Um, and we need bees. Uh, the causes of bee die-offs include our changing climate, pesticides, habitat loss, and disease. And often it's all these things working in concert or together that are making life hard for the bees. Um, but as I said, thankfully states have been at the forefront of many of the solutions. Um, we have, we have uh, a number of states that have adopted policies uh, to protect the bees and save the bees. Um, in 2016, the states of Connecticut and Maryland restricted bee killing neonic pesticides, neonics are short for neonicotinoids, a type of pesticide that's applied and often coated right on seeds. In the states, in the years that followed, sorry, in the years that followed, we saw Vermont, Massachusetts, Maine, and then last year we saw New Jersey and New York all adopt policies to restrict neonics. Um, most of these states have done it via the legislature. A couple of did it, a couple did it via administrative rulemaking. But even in those states, it was the legislature that kicked things off and got the ball rolling on this. Um, the details of the laws differ a little bit, but um, some of the key fe features were that um, the bills restricted the sale of neonics unless you're a certified applicator. Um, someone who's trained on, on pesticides and educated on pesticides and the dangers of neonics. 
Um, states have also restricted their use in parks and others, others in landscaping. And it's been a big campaign to do this, and it's taken a lot of effort. So I wanted to just show some of the photos right now. Thank you, Ben. Um, in the upper left, there's our staff at Environment Colorado with a number of chefs talking about the need for bees from a food production perspective. There's um, We've gone door to door and talked to people face to face in districts and in communi communities around the country. Here's a photo of um, Ben Brundy, who's with us here in the webinar today, helping helping run this. And that's him here in California talking to someone about saving the bees. And then in the lower right, that's uh, Governor Mills in Maine and our staff in Maine uh, at a signing ceremony for the passage of their bill um, to save the bees. And they're all wearing the COVID masks you can see, but what you can't quite see unless you really blew it up would be that the masks all say save the bees. Kind of a fun little thing that we did. Um, and I want to do a couple shout outs to some of those champions of these other states that I've highlighted. Uh, I know I'll miss some and I apologize, but in Maryland, we have Delegate Ann Healy and Senator Shirley Nathan Pulliam. Uh, in Vermont, we have Rep. Amy Sheldon. In Maine, we have Nicole, Representative Nicole Grahoski. In Massachusetts, we had then Representative Carolyn uh, Dykema. Um, in New Jersey, Assembly Member Clinton Calabresi, and in New York, Senator Brad Hoylman Seagal, who've all been champions of efforts to save the bees. Of course, winning on these things takes a lot more than just a legislator who a legislator who introduces the bill. So there's a lot more people to thank. But for the sake of time, I want to turn it over to our first guest, guest Sarah Goodman, who will be talking about efforts. Uh, with assembly member, she works with assembly member Rebecca Bauer Cahan, and she'll be talking about efforts here in California. So, Sarah, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Steve and Ben, and thanks to everyone for being here. Um, I was privileged enough to work for the assembly member, assembly member Rebecca Bauer Cahan, when she authored uh, 2146 last year, and I staffed that bill, um, and hopefully can shed some light on the process and kind of how we got there today. Um, you know, it's really great to talk to all of you because it's really the advocates that brought this bill and, and made it possible to protect biodiversity in general and protect bees and other pollinators specifically, because if there weren't passionate human voices advocating for them, we wouldn't be able to muster the political will to get these types of bills through the legislature. Um, as you may know, California beekeepers alone lost over 40% of their colonies in 2021, and those devastating numbers continued through 2022. Um, evidence is mounting that the devastating loss of all these pollinators is in large part due to their overexposure to toxic chemicals, uh, particularly those caused found in neonicotinoids, which are the most popular and most used pesticide on the market. Uh, they are neurotoxins, which means there's like lead and other neurotoxins, there's no safe level of them. Any level of neonicotinoids, whether it be for humans or for pollinators, is toxic. Um, and so exposure to these through unnecessary applications, particularly when it's to a home garden or to a golf course and it's not even producing food, is really something that we sought to mitigate last year. Um, in general, even you know, beyond those health impacts, uh, loss of pollinators endangers $15 billion in state agricultural production every year. Um, it drives up food prices, uh, shipping in colonies year after year that are destined to be killed by um, pesticides, costs farmers a huge amount of money that it doesn't need to because we don't need to expose them. There are many other alternatives to neonicotinoids that are much, much safer for pollinators and for humans. Um, so like I said last year, I had the privilege of staffing AB 2146, which limited the use of neonicotinoid pesticides for all non-agricultural uses. That means golf courses, that means home uses, landscaping, anything that doesn't produce commercial food. Um, and one element of this was even certified applicators were not allowed to use neonicotinoids, except in cases where it was for on structure or near structure extermination. So if you have an infestation, you could still use them, but otherwise like 
uh, lawn care specialists were not allowed to use neonics either, because at the end of the day, those uses were not necessary. Um, people were applying neonicotinoids without even knowing that they were. They would often apply them to their like pollinator friendly gardens um, because people misunderstand that you know even if a pesticide isn't sprayed, it's still affecting pollinators in the area uh, through the plants because it, these chemicals are watered into the soil and then they persist in the plants and their pollen that are carried back to hives um, for the entire life cycle of the plant. So even if just the ground that plants are planted in is treated once with neonics, um, those plants can be infest or affected for their entire lifespan. Um, and with trees, that's many, many, many years. Um, you know, as you well know, if we're going to be able to protect our food system, our environment, and our health, we need to address the devastation of our pollinator populations. And this bill itself was part of kind of a global movement to make that happen with neonics being completely banned in the European Union with some small exceptions. Um, and as was mentioned before, New Jersey, New York, Maryland, passing other restrictions. Um, in places like the EU, there were none of the negative consequences that uh, opposition to these bills trotted out, especially with regards to the non-agricultural uses, you know, there's really no downside to limiting these the uses of these pesticides, especially when there are safer alternatives available. Um, it's just simply unnecessary. Unfortunately, with AB 2146, we did face a veto from Governor Newsom based on the fact that he said that it was the Department of Pesticide Regulation's job to be regulating these pesticides. So we're working on making sure that that happens this year. We're in close contact with the department and we're exploring different avenues to make sure that that evaluation happens quickly and happens with an eye towards human and pollinator health. Um, thank you again for all of your advocacy. You know, again, without your voices, toxic substances would continue to be added without restriction to the environment. And it's your voices advocating your letters and your engagement with representatives that make it possible and made it possible last year to get farther within the unicondoid restriction than anyone had in the past. So hopefully we can make that continue to happen this year. And thank you all for your support. Thank you, Sarah. Um, again, there are seven states that have acted in this way to restrict and limit neonics. We're so close in California to being the eighth. We're so close last year. And like Sarah said in the veto message, the governor said that he intended to have his agency do that. So whether that happens in an upcoming session legislatively or via rulemaking, we in California would be very excited to be number eight. I should also highlight that our staff at Environment Colorado and in Colorado are adamant that they will be eighth, the eighth state that they will actually jump in the queue ahead of California and become the eighth state to restrict and limit neonics. There in Colorado, the Pesticide Applicators Act is up for a seven re year renewal and review and renewal, which will be the perfect time to look at the act and look at what needs to change and, and to protect bees from neonic pesticides, bee killing pesticides. Um, if we have any legislators or staffers on or advocates on from Rhode Island, they will also tell you that they are continuing to make progress um, and getting oh so close to having Rhode Island be the eighth state. So a number of states are vying and I, I, I suspect there are even, I hope at least, and suspect that there are more than those three who are vying to be, to be next. Um, okay, there are other efforts to protect bees Beyond pesticides, they're important, one of which is habitat, which I want to talk about. But first, we had a we have a video we want to show from Sen Senator Judith Zaffarini from Texas, who's very excited to continue to work on saving the bees and uh, is exploring a number of opportunities in Texas. So Ben, if you can if you can cue that. I'm Judith Safidini, State Senator for District 21 from Laredo. I'm confident we all agree with anthropologist Margaret Mead that we won't have a society if we destroy the environment. 
Our beliefs are based on our knowledge that one third of all food consumed by Americans is pollinated by bees. While honeybees annually pollinate an estimated $15 billion worth of crops in the United States. What's more, the U.S. Department of Agriculture reports bee pollination increases the yield for more than 90 different crops, including peanuts, by approximately 62%. Undoubtedly, our leadership in protecting pollinators, including by reducing pesticide usage, favorably would impact the prosperity and well being of future generations. Across the country, however, honeybees and native bees alike are dying at unprecedented and unsustainable rates. That is why I'm committed to doing more to protect nature's best pollinators, including the more than 1,000 native bee species we have in Texas. In 2021, my Senate Bill 1722 would have established the Texas Pollinator Smart Program to encourage the establishment and conservation of habitats for bees, birds, and other pollinators at and near solar energy sites. Although the legislature passed my bill overwhelmingly, much to my chagrin, it was vetoed. The veto was disappointing, but not discouraging. Persistence is the key to our success, as evidenced by our passing my bill prohibiting texting while driving after 10 years. The point is that we must persist. Today, you will hear about statewide efforts to restrict pesticides linked to impairment of bees' ability to navigate and to forage for food, about their increased susceptibility to infection, and about their decreasing population growth and reproduction. The more we learn about this important issue, the more empowered we will be to succeed by informing and persuading others to our cause. Count on me always to collaborate with you with constituents and with stakeholders to identify, study, and pursue solutions to this critical environmental problem in Texas. Together, we can reflect Margaret Mead's belief that never to doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, is the only thing that ever has, and we must. My prayer is that the Lord will bless you for your good work and inspire you to continue to excel as environmental stewards by pursuing the cause of bees. Thank you for everything you do and for everything you will do. Okay, thank you, Senator Zaffarini from Texas for sending in that video. Sorry you couldn't be with us, but I understand the committee obligations as I'm sure others on the, on the call here do as well. I want to talk briefly about habitat um, and efforts, and uh, then I want to turn it, get into the Q and A. If folks have questions, we we were planning on a thirty minute webinar, so we're approaching approaching the end, but we have a time to cover both of these. I think really quickly. So let's talk habitat. Um, habitat so important for bees. Um, much of their habitats, e even out in 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 farm country, uh, is not what it once was or maybe I should say, especially out in farm country, it's not what it once was. And um, having small patches of habitat for bees, especially when stitched together across a broader area can be so important for them. Um, and I wanna to touch upon a couple of state uh, policies and other policies that, that have been enacted or could. So one is uh, roadsides. Roadsides are a perfect place to plant native plants pollinator friendly plants where bees, butterflies, and more can thrive. A um, number of states have done various things in this regard. I'll just highlight again, California, where in 2018, there was a, a bill to, um, to plant and revegetate our roadsides with pollinator friendly plants. It made it through the assembly and the Senate with not a single no vote. So it was, it was quite popular. Uh, in large part because people understood um, the importance of this. Um, I want to also highlight a federal bill. In, it was the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which creates a pot of money, $10 million over five years, that's for state grants. So states can apply for grants to plant pollinator-friendly habitat along roadsides. Important victory in the um, infrastructure bill. Now, 
<clears throat> I should say we just need Congress to actually appropriate the money and put the money there so that the grant program can, and and I, I know it will, but so that the grant grant program can get up and running and states can apply for this. People have been talking a lot, and there are a lot of different programs and monies available for green rooftops. can be really effective on flat roofs like schools and government buildings, so it's something that states can and should be looking at doing. Um, interestingly enough, it's really effective from an energy efficiency and cost savings perspective there. And perhaps most interesting to me, it can mean that the roofs last longer with fewer repairs. So that's an opportunity for us and others to pursue in the states. Um, and then Utah, I want to single out, had a, a pilot program that it passed through the legislature to do uh, to, and set a goal for the number of pollinator friendly plantings in the state um, and throughout the state. And it provides money for private parties, for local governments, for nonprofits and others to do pollinator friendly plantings. So there are a lot of opportunities in front of us, a lot, so much we can do in the States and need to do in the States. And it's imperative that we do it bees are, because bees are disappearing and they're nature's best pollinators. Um, bees are responsible for the stunning hillsides full of wildflowers that just are amazing to look at. They're also responsible for much of the food that's on our plates and that we eat. Um, and in a larger sense, they're just imp so important for the ecosystems that we need to be healthy all around us. So I want to turn it over to Q&A, but before I do, I want to thank again, um, Sarah, you be for being on. Uh, I want to thank Senator Zaffarini for the video and thank everyone for joining the webinar.